of our next, next guest speaker, which is Dr. Jeffrey Miller, uh, who is a, I'm cheating, I'm reading it right here. <laughs> he is an assistant professor of surgery, division of cardiothoracic surgery at Emory University School of Medicine. Um, he happens also to be the doctor of some of our uh, patients that come to our support group, and uh, that's how I find out about you, uh, as well as um, uh, other patients that come, that um, some other doctors uh, in the Atlanta community who've um, highly, highly think of you. So uh, without further ado, I want uh, for all of you to welcome Dr. Miller. That, that was such a nice introduction for a minute, I thought someone else was speaking. So um, uh, I realize this is the last uh, lecture before lunch, and I know from previous experience to keep the lecture short, because uh, we all have food on our mind. Uh, when you give talks, as, uh, Emory University is new to me. I've been at St. Joseph's Hospital for 13 years, 14 years now. Uh, Emory recently uh, merged with us, and so now I'm on faculty at Emory. But when you get, give these talks, you have to start out with giving disclosures. So unfortunately, I have no significant financial relationship with any uh, pharmaceutical companies. Um, this is Houston, Texas, where I was born and raised in, 19, in the 1960s. Uh, you can see that's Main Street going uh, up and down straight uh, through the slide. Uh, that's Methodist Hospital, you can see there in the upper right-hand corner. And this is uh, Houston now in the Texas Medical Center where I was born. Uh, this is the biggest medical center in the world. Uh, you can see it's about as big as downtown, which is uh, at the top of your screen. Uh, there's um, uh, hundreds of uh, hospitals and uh, uh, doctors and facilities there. Uh, this is Dr. Michael DeBakey, the foremost heart surgeon of our time. I was fortunate enough to spend four years of medical school and then five years of general surgery residency there, uh, training under Dr. DeBakey. And then I went to New York to do my cardiothoracic surgery fellowship, uh, which is heart and lung surgery fellowship. And that's uh, NYU uh, First Avenue and the East River there uh, behind you. Uh, and then about uh, 14 years ago, I came to Atlanta and um, have been practicing there at St. Joseph's Hospital, doing both heart and thoracic surgery, heart and lung. So routinely I do bypass surgery, valve surgery. I'm the director of our uh, heart transplant and uh, mechanical pump uh, program. But we got into robotics about 10 years ago. Dr. Murphy, uh, our, our president, uh, the chief of heart surgery at, at uh, St. Joseph's, is probably one of the most uh, accomplished robotic heart surgeons in the country, maybe even in the world. So we got really into robotics, and he was doing most of the robotic heart surgery, but I started to do a lot of robotic thoracic surgery and was doing lungs and uh, mediastinal tumors, and, and that's how I got into thymectomies. Um, this is uh, an ultrasound. It's not the heart. That's not the left ventricle and right ventricle. Uh, that's twin A and twin B. So my life changed about uh, eight years ago. And um, this is our son, Jake, and uh, his uh, twin sister, Morgan. And uh, here they are now with my wife. So um, we'll talk a little bit more about how they fit into this talk a little bit later. Um, I'm going to go a little bit over my Senate. You probably know as much about the disease as I do, uh, but then in the end we'll look at it, some actual surgeries uh, for the, uh, for the uh, disease. The incidence is about 200 per million. It has a bimodal distribution. Uh, people get it in their 20s and 30s, and then we see people in their 60s to 80s uh, get it in later decades in their life. Uh, the, the disease consists of antibodies against the acetylcholine receptors, as you know. There's a different kind, also muscle-specific tyrone kinase. Uh, tyrosine kinase, and there's a theory that these acetylcholine receptor antibodies may come from the germinal centers of the thymus. To be honest, we don't really understand why thymectomy uh, helps with myasthenia gravis, but this is uh, one of the theories that has been shown uh, to be true in some laboratory um, testing. The symptoms, as you know, uh, fatigability, fatigable weakness, it fluctuates during the day, uh, ptosis or the uh, eyelid droop, diplopia or double vision, uh, dysphagia or difficulty swallowing and talking. Uh, some people are affected in their breathing. And it, its hallmark is this central weakness, uh, difficulty in raising the arms. And when I was in medical school, I remember to this day what they taught us is that the most difficult thing for a patient with myasthenia gravis is rising from a sitting position, getting out, getting out of a chair. 
The diagnosis is made in a, a majority of different ways uh, by the neurologist. Uh, the clinical signs is the first uh, signal that we should uh, investigate this further uh, for central muscle weakness. Uh, the ice pack te test where you put an ice pack on the eyes uh, for three to five minutes and see if the ptosis improves. Uh, the Tensilon test is kind of what I remember from, uh, from school, uh, which is an acetylcholinesterase inhibitor and can uh, improve the symptoms temporarily because it's fast acting but not, doesn't last very long. And then the serological test where they actually look for the acetylcholine receptors or uh, musk antibodies. And then finally, electrophysiological electrophysio testing uh, with uh, nerve stimulation studies. And this is kind of in the area of the neurologist, but most of the patients that I see come to me with a diagnosis of myasthenia gravis so that I can sit down and talk to them about the operation thymectomy. Uh, the treatment uh, is acetylcholinesterase inhibitors. Most of the pi patients I see are on fairly large doses of mestinon and other immunomodulating uh, medications, steroids like prednisone, uh, uh, IVIG, which you were talking about when I walked in. Plasmapheresis is good for acute exacerbations. It uh, doesn't work very long, but it can temporarily provide relief uh, for acute exacerbations. Uh, azathioprine, cyclosporin, which we use in heart transplantation uh, all the time, uh, mycophenolate, mofetil, or Celsept, which we also use in heart transplantation. Uh, these are immunosuppressants, and rituximide or rituxan. Um, when you look at the thymus gland, which sits in front of the heart uh, in myasthenia gravis patients, about 30% of them have a normal thymus. The CT scan is normal. It just looks like any other uh, CT scan. The thymus gland itself is a large gland that sits in front of the heart behind your breastbone. And when you're first born, it's responsible for producing cells that fight the immune system. And as you get older, other organs take over this function, the bone marrow, the liver, the spleen. And the thymus involutes or shrinks. So over time, the thymus continues to shrink. When we operate on young people, they have these big thymus glands in front of their heart. The older you are, the smaller the thymus. So I operate, I do open heart surgery every day, so I'm looking at the thymus every day. The older patients don't have much thymus left. It's just involuted and, and has, uh, is much smaller, and there's just some fatty tissue in there. But on younger patients, you see more thymus tissue. So in the myasthenia patients, about 30% have normal thymus. About 60% have enlarged thymus or thymic hyperplasia, and about 10% might have a thymoma, which is actually a tumor of the thymus gland, which can or uh, may or may not be uh, malignant. Now, it's a little bit counterintuitive, uh, and we'll go into this a little bit more later, but the people with normal thymus glands that don't show anything on CT actually do better with thymectomy than those with enlarged thymus or a thymoma. It's counterintuitive. You'd think, oh, if I had a big tumor in my chest and you took it out, my myasthenia is going to get better. It's actually the opposite. The patients with nothing on their CAT scan tend to get more benefit from the uh, operation itself. So the ideal patient that comes to see me for a thymectomy is young. Um, patients who are young do better with thymectomy. Having said that, I think the oldest one I've done is in their 70s. So um, there is some benefit to doing it in older patients, although it's uh, not as ideal in a younger patient. Um, patients with ocular and facial symptoms tend to do better than those without, and this is in terms of the success of thymectomy in controlling the symptoms. And again, as I previously mentioned, people with a normal CT scan, so no thymoma at all, tend to do better than those with a large uh, thymoma or a tumor there. And when I sit down in my office with, with myasthenia gravis patients talking about thymectomy, I give them the one-third rules, and this is based on some data from the Cleveland Clinic. So when you take someone to the operating room and take out their thymus, one-third are generally cured. Their um, neurological symptoms are resolved. They're much better. They're off mestinon, they're off steroids, and they do great. One-third are improved, but still have some symptoms and still have to take medications, and one-third have no benefit at all. So it's, most of the surgery we do have, much, have better results or better, better uh, percentages, but uh, this, this disease in particular has this one-third rule where we can't cure or even help everybody. 
And uh, again, the people that do the best are the ones that I mentioned uh, several slides ago. So this is a CT scan, and everybody that we're going to consider for a thymectomy uh, uh, um, have CT scans, usually ordered by the uh, neurologist before they see me. So I don't, I don't have a pointer, but in the middle of the chest is the heart and the aorta, the, the big round thing at the top uh, uh, on, on this side, on my side of the screen is the aorta, and next to it is the pulmonary artery, behind it is the heart. This is the spine right here. These white things are the ribs. The black things are the lungs, because there is black on a CAT scan. And you can see the, the uh, red circled mass at the top. On your top left, that's a very small thymoma. So a little tumor sitting on the front of the heart behind the breastbone, which is the white structure at the top of the screen. So this is a patient with a very small thymoma uh, that uh, was sent to me for thymectomy. Not everybody that has these mediastinal masses has myosinic gravis. I see a lot more patients that have these anterior mediastinal masses and thymoma that don't have myosinia gravis then I see patients with myasthenia gravis. So I'm taking out anterior mediastinal tumors all the time, uh, and only a fraction of those have myasthenia gravis. So this is a patient with a much bigger tumor. This CT scan has IV contrast, so it's a little bit easier to distinguish between the tumor and the vessels. So you can see the aorta is the big round white artery uh, up here. The pulmonary artery is right next to it. Behind it, those two little black circles are the windpipe, and then you can see that big tumor. Everybody see it at the top, uh, right behind the breastbone. Oh, that's great. Oh, you're great. That's terrific. I almost asked if anyone has one, but I said, I don't think so. That's great. So there's the um, thymoma right there. There's the aorta. There's the pulmonary artery. This is the descending aorta coming down the back. There's your windpipe going, uh, your trachea uh, going to your lungs. The black on either side is the lungs. And uh, these white things are the ribs. And then this is the spine back here. And this is your breastbone, the sternum right here. So this is a big anterior mediastinal tumor. There are other things that could be when I see CT scans like this. Uh, probably most common is the thymoma. It can also be lymphoma, a cancer of the lymph nodes, which is generally treatable. And then there are other tumors uh, that uh, can live in the anterior mediastinum as well. But those are probably the two most common ones. And then this is an even bigger thymoma. Uh, you can see here's the aortic arch. Uh, this is the superior vena cava, the windpipe. Uh, the esophagus is right here. Again, the backbone. The breastbone is right here. And then this is a huge anterior mediastinal tumor, which uh, turned out to be a thymoma. And then finally, this is a giant one. I mean, they can, they can get really big. So this is the heart being kind of pushed over, uh, shifted into the left chest and a giant uh, anterior mediastinal tumor taking up the entire right chest. So we see a lot of tumors. Most of them we can get out with a robot. Uh, sometimes we have to divide the sternum. So if you come to me and we sit down and, and talk about thymectomy for myasthenia gravis and we decide to proceed, there's really two options. In the olden days, we did all of them via sternotomy. So we divided the breastbone, and I have a movie of that. And then more recently, we do it with the robot, and I have, I have some movies of that as well. So obviously the sternotomy is a big incision. We divide the breastbone and we crank open the chest and we have very good visualization of everything, but it's very invasive and it takes a long time to recover. And it, ha it uh, has some risks involved. Uh, and it's hard to justify doing an operation that's so invasive when you only have a one-third chance of cure another one-third chance of improvement, but a one-third chance of no improvement at all. And so who wants to go through a sternotomy, a big operation, if you have a one-third chance that it's not going to do anything at all? So it's great that we've been able to advance technology to the point where now we can do almost all of these with the robot through tiny little incisions in the right chest and the left chest. Uh, some people are doing it through the neck, a cervical incision. Others are doing it through a small, what's called a hemisternotomy. So we divide half the sternum. There's lots of ways to skin a cat here. But I think by far the best is the robotic approach. So if you don't like blood or, or anything else, you may not want to watch these next few slides. So this is, uh, this is the chest. Here's the head. Here's the feet are down here. And I'm making the incision. 
This, I always think when, when I was helping my son on a project and I had a knife and he said, give me that, Dad, you don't know how to use a knife. <laughs> but, um, but uh, so this is, uh, we divide the breastbone and this is a bovie electric cautery we're just using to kind of go through the, uh, go through the tissue. And then th this is a saw and we uh, divide the breastbone with the saw. So you can see how, how invasive this is. So that's the edges of the breastbone. We're just now uh, controlling the bleeding. And then this is, um, this is a bovie electric artery. So all this fat in the front of the heart is the thymus gland. And it's hard to distinguish between the thymus gland and the fat. So we take everything out. We go all, th and this is just a bovie electric artery. That white glistening structure underneath is the pericardium. So that's the sac around the heart. And right behind that is the heart. So we take all of the tissue away from the pericardium. And we go, we have four goals. We go all the way to the diaphragm towards the bottom. Up here, we go all the way to the neck. And I'll show you later that the thymus gland has two horns. And we have to go into the neck to get the horns. And, and the key to this operation is to get all thymus tissue. So we're very aggressive. Up in the neck is a big vein called the anominate vein. And we skeletonize that. So we take all the tissue off in front of it and behind it. And I'll show you that. So from the diaphragm below, the neck and the vein at the top, and on either side, our limitations are these two nerves called the phrenic nerves, which make the diaphragm go up and down, and I'll show you that too. So we take all the tissue, all the fat, all the tissue, from the diaphragm to the neck, and from the left phrenic nerve to the right phrenic nerve. So that's the operation through sternotomy, and that's how we used to do the operation. So. I guess about 15 years ago, uh, the robotic approach started to become uh, favorable, and uh, we've been doing it for over 10 years. So the surgeon sits at the robotic console, and his hands are controlling the instruments that are going into the chest. So the robot has four arms, and you control all, all the arms uh, from the console. And, and these four arms go into the chest through tiny incisions. And in the middle arm is a 10 times magnified high definition three-dimensional camera so it's like you're in the chest operating you're right there so people say it's harder you don't have as much exposure you actually have better exposure because it's right there and it's magnified so much so these are actually hand in these little uh, instruments and you turn them and twist them and control the instruments that are in the chest so this is a patient that uh, was having a robotic thymectomy. Uh, you can see the, uh, this is the left side of her chest. Uh, the, these little 10 millimeter ports are going into the chest through tiny incisions. This is the camera port. This is the right arm. And this is the left arm. So this is a video. Now you're looking, you're seeing exactly what I'm seeing when I'm doing the operation. So again, this is the um, thymic tissue. This fat and tissue, we just kind of tease off this white glistening pericardium, which is a sac around the heart. You can see right below it, this white structure here is the phrenic nerve. So I stay just on top of the phrenic nerve so we don't injure that. And uh, then, then you have trouble breathing because we uh, affect the diaphragm. And again, this is just a bovie electric carter. We can clip little vessels that are coming off. This blue structure right here is the anominate vein that I was telling you about. That's that vein that sits up there that we use as our upper margin. And kind of just teasing it off, a little bit of bovie electric artery where we're actually burning the tissue so it doesn't bleed, a little bit of gentle teasing and finesse. And then you can see I have the whole specimen kind of sitting up there. This is from the other side now. And uh, we're going up into the left horn. So remember I told you we have to go up into the neck. Some naysayers say, oh, well, with the robot, you can't get the horns up in the neck. But again, this is the vein right here. And I'm going up into the neck and pulling it down and pulling that horn out of the neck all the way up to your thymus, uh, to your uh, thyroid gland. And again, you can put that camera way up into the neck and you're right there. So it's actually, it's actually easier for me to get the part in the neck and not more difficult as some people have said. That's the vein right there. And again, this is the left horn 
going up into the neck. And now um, you can see this is a white lobular structure. This patient also had a thymoma. There's the phrenic nerve. You see that white thing right there? That's the phrenic nerve. Look how obvious it is. Uh, so we stay just on top of it so we don't injure it. And you saw, I think it'll come into the picture one more time. This is, there it is. That white kind of fibrous looking thing is the uh, actual thymoma. So we don't just take the thymoma. We take all the tissue with it to make sure we've gotten all thymic tissue. Again, behind it is the pericardium, and we're just boving down all that tissue. Now, I've heard about tissue being left. Yeah. Well, it's hard to get all of it because you don't want to injure this structure. So there can be tiny little nests of thymic tissue left, and that, that does affect the success of the operation. But if you get too close to the phrenic, you'll injure the phrenic, and their diaphragm will be elevated and paralyzed and you'll really be in trouble. So like everything, there's limits. And then I, I think this is our last one. We're just putting the entire specimen into this endo bag. So you see this bag? This is, can be the most challenging part of the operation. So we're just kind of stuffing it into the bag. And then we pull, close the bag, and we pull it really hard out one of those small holes. Usually we have to make the hole a little better. You see the bag there? And now we're just tightening the bag. And then this is the end. So you see there's no more thymic tissue left, and um, so um, that's, the, that's the operation. So um, uh, I, we've, I've, I've taken out probably over 100 anterior mediastinal mass. I've probably done 20 thymectomies for myasthenia gravis. One patient we had to convert to sternotomy. Uh, he was an older gentleman, and uh, it was a difficult uh, exposure. Uh, but we've had uh, great success and uh, with very good follow-up. And um, there's been lots of studies to show robotic thymectomy is as good as sternotomy thymectomy. There's been studies to show thymectomy is better than medical therapy. And I think that it's really a, a standard of care for young patients with uh, myasthenia gravis, especially now that we have this to offer. Um, as an academic surgeon now with Emory, I like to do my own research, and I have for a long time, to kind of compare thymectomy to medical therapy at home with my children. So um, my daughter got to be thymectomy. He's a mestinon. You can see she's, uh, she's kind of kicking his rear end. And uh, even in the end, he came over to thymectomy as well. <laughs> so uh, thank you very much. I'm happy to answer any questions. Uh. Yes. No, it's a good question. We cut right through it. And... Uh, and uh, leave it in. It just uh, um, most of the patients that we do heart surgery on are older, so it's unlikely that they're going to develop it. I'm not sure if taking it out would prevent the development of, of myasthenia gravis in the future, uh, but um, it's a good question. But it's just t too much work in these uh, high risk cases. When we do heart surgery every day, we also give a lot of blood thinner called heparin to go on the heart lung machine. And so if you try to dissect out the entire thymus and then give blood thinner, you could uh, have some problem with bleeding. Yes? So the thymus can grow back? Uh, it, it doesn't usually grow back when you take it all out. Now, there may be some nests of cells. If you have a thymic tumor, a thymoma, that's, uh, which is they can be malignant, then yes, those can grow back. And, and uh, when we, um, when we take out anterior mediastinal masses and they turn out to be thymomas, they look under the microscope to see how aggressive the cells are. They also look under the microscope in pathology to see if it's invaded the capsule. And if it has invaded the capsule, which is the kind of sac around the thymoma, uh, then those patients actually get additional radiation therapy and sometimes even chemotherapy. So these anterior mediastinal tumors can act malignant. They can be aggressive, they can recur, and they can even result in death. So if you have a thymectomy, but you didn't have a 
had a tumor, and you have great improvement afterward for about five years, and then you start going back again. Could the thymus be it, causing a problem? It could be. It's unlikely. I I, 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 it's unlikely. But you wouldn't I wouldn't go back in. I get a CT scan to see see if anything's there's any mass there, but I wouldn't go back in. I recently went back in, a young girl had a thymectomy for myasthenia gravis, but she had a very aggressive thymoma, and um, she had her operation done, I think, in Savannah, and she was about a year and a half out, and on CAT scan, it showed a recurrence near the phrenic nerve, and I did go back in to her with the robot. We took out the remainder of the thymus uh, tumor, I sacrificed her phrenic nerve to get all of it, and she's getting radiation now. So these, these anterior mediastinal masses can be quite aggressive. Yes? Yes, I was wondering then, 30% of the CAT scan is normal. What then is the criterion to make somebody eligible for thymus? Well, we'll do it regardless. Even if, uh, they, uh, if they have a normal CAT scan, that's even better because they get the most benefit. If they have a tumor there, either thymic hyperplasia, so the thymus is enlarged, or they have a thymoma, which is a tumor, a mass like we looked at, we'll still do the operation. Uh, they, don't, they may not get as much neurological benefit, but they get a lot of benefit from taking out the tumor. Correct, correct, yes. Yeah, I think it's standard of care, and they, they generally do. I haven't had any trouble. Yes? Can, can, I, I had my thymus took out, and there was a tumor there. Can you tell me what percentage chance that the thymus would, would, would grow back? Yeah, it just all depends on your pathology. So you'd have to look at the pathology report and see if uh, um, there's different categories, there's different stages. Uh, and so I think the most important thing is did it invade the capsule? And if it didn't, then I think it's very unlikely it would ever grow back. Yes? So would a person uh, 76 or with a pacemaker be ineligible? Uh, it would be higher risk, but I wouldn't say ineligible. Not okay. I, I, would, I would see the patient and talk to them about it. I would be high risk and... But uh, yeah, I don't. I I, I would probably tr shy away from it unless you were really having trouble being controlled on medical therapy. Yes. Um, touching on what she was saying, the question I asked about the tissue being left in. Um, thymectomy. Um, thymus was normal. Had the thymectomy. Went in remission for several several years. Came out of remission. And having problems getting off prednisone, and the doctors thinking about think maybe tissue was left in, but to do a CT scan now, if they do a CT scan, and if it's and like you said, it's possible that it was just not in a good area if the tissue was left in. Would you? Uh, I wouldn't operate unless there was a mass on CT scan. Right. You can, you know, the thymus tissue is in the center of the chest, right in front of the heart. <clears throat> but you can also have ectopic tissue in weird places, other places. Mm -hmm. <coughs> That's why we try to take all the tissue and fat as much as we can. Mm -hmm. But there's a possibility you could have small cells or nests of thymic tissue uh, left in strange areas where we can't get to. There's no way of knowing, but yes. It can take years to see the improvements from thymectomy. It's a good question. Um, uh, so you start, we send patients home on the same exact regimen they were on, and then the neurologist slowly tapers them. And most people who get benefit from the thymectomy will tolerate the tapering of the medications. Uh, some people taper to off. Some people taper but still need some medication, and some people don't tolerate tapering at all. That's that one-third rule. But, but in fact, over two to three years, you could continue to see improvement in your symptoms after thymectomy. Are you actually doing is that, you mentioned uh, only in St. Joe Merge, so are you actually doing still at St. Joe? Yeah, I'm still at St. Joseph's. And that's where this is all? Correct, happening? correct. What kind of referral system is it? Do you got to be referred to instantly, or how would somebody, if they ever? 
Uh, you, I would talk to your a neurologist and have them uh, send you to me, uh, and, or you can call our office and come in and see me. Either way. Uh, we um, we do single vessel bypass with the robot, uh, triple bypasses, double bypasses. Those things are still sternotomy. Uh, we do mitral valve with the robot. Dr. Murphy, my boss, is like I said, probably one of the most accomplished robotic mitral valve surgeons in the country. And uh, aortic valves we do through small incisions, but not with the robot. He he, uh, he passed away just before I came. Yeah, okay. actually, yeah. He was very good. Yeah, kid. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, it's less likely to benefit must patients, but um, I don't think I have. <laughs> yes. It's a, it's a good question. I, um, theoretically, you would assume that they got all the tissue they could in the neck. So you're supposed to go in front of them behind that vein that we looked at, and then all the way up to the left and right horns, and um, um, all the way up to the um, thyroid gland. So I don't, I don't think that a CT scan of the neck would show you any ectopic tissue or mass. Yes? There are in other diseases like parathyroid disease and thyroid disease. We have these special scans that can look for ectopic tissue, but not in not in this. Yes. That's a generally kind of accepted uh, rule that came out of the Cleveland Clinic experience in the early days of thymectomy. What they observed. Well, that's not true, um, but uh, it may be because of your age. Yeah. What are you, 40? <laughs> 27 plus tax, right? 27 plus tax. No, 63. So it's not a true statement that you're not a candidate for thymectomy because the CT was normal. Yes. So probably the 20s and 30s are the ones that get the most benefit. I think the older you get, the less benefit you get. But like I said, I've, I've done it on a 70-year-old that was very refractory to medical therapy. What are you being told not to do anymore because people are 75 or 76 or a certain age? I'm being told a lot, but I don't listen. <laughs> It is a tough. I mean, it's tough when you see older people and you're not sure if they're going to benefit, you know, from surgery. And uh, I wish we had a crystal ball, but it's it's judgment. And uh, a lot of times when there are difficult cases like that, uh, it's nice to be in a big group like uh, we are. There we have uh, six or seven heart surgeons at, uh, and thoracic surgeons at St. Joseph's. And so in these difficult cases of older people, you ask four partners, what would you do? And you look at the films and you review the case. and you get different opinions, and we have conferences where we present uh, difficult patients, and then we have a room full of people talking about talking about you. So there are things to do, but these can be tough tough decisions. Do patients have to be at a certain level of immunosuppressive? Like, do you look for them to kind of decrease the cordial surgery? It's a good it's it's a good question. I usually call the neurologist and say, "Do you think they're ready for it?" Um, uh, obviously, if they've had a recent acute exacerbation, if they've had recent uh, plasmapheresis or IVIG, I tend to sh shy away from it. Uh, most of my, the patients are on pretty hefty doses of mestinon. Most are on steroids, and uh, that, that's usually what I think I see most commonly. So you don't look for them to try to get to a lower level? 
I think one time a neurologist said, well, let me plas plasmapheresis them before the surgery, and then they'll do better getting off the ventilator and, and this and that. But uh, there's also some risk to that, to, to operating on a patient that's uh, immunosuppressed uh, in terms of infection and, and healing. So uh, I usually rely on the neurologist to kind of tell me when the best timing is. Okay, well, thank you so much for having me, and uh, have a nice lunch.